If you'll turn to the back of your bulletin, you will find an outline, some notes for the message this morning. And the message is going to be on the Samson, the strongest weakling in the Bible. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do a transition. I like to do a transition because I've been up here leading the music and all, not leading, but helping the ladies lead the music. And uh, uh, so, you know, i got to get in a sermon mode, so I usually have a transition. So I want to read a story to you. You know, when we think about Samson so much, we think about Superman. Superman, when he goes into the, the telephone booth and and some of you don't know what that is, but goes into the telephone booth and he comes out and he's Superman. So we think of Superman being strong and we think of Samson being strong. And so I have a little story here about Superman. Due to the budget constraints, the board of the Daily Planet advised Perry White that he had to let one of his star reporters go. He was really overwhelmed about the magnitude of the decision. Who would go? Clark Kent or Lois Lane? He actually did some praying, which he hadn't done in a long time, and he asked God, he said, please show me a sign. That afternoon he was doing some shopping at Walmart, and when he went to his car, he suddenly saw the answer. The next day he called Clark Kent and Lois Lane into the office, and he said, I'm sorry, Lois, but you have to go. After Lois collected her things and left, Clark took Perry aside and asked, Chief, how did you know which one of us ought to go? Perry said, well, that turned out to be easier than I thought. While I was parking at Walmart, I looked up and there was the sign, Fire Lane. <laughs> Whew, I'm transitioning now. Try again. <laughs> right. We're going to take a look at Samson this morning, and Samson is one of the heroes of the faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, it lists the heroes of the faith, and we find in there, we find Abraham, and we find Joseph, and Moses, and Joshua, and those are some of the names that we expect. And then we find Gideon and Barak and Samson. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, Hebrews 11, 32, should be on the screen. Ah, there it is. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets. There among the heroes of the faith, we find Samson. Now, Samson seems like an unlikely candidate for a hero of the faith. He had everything going for him, but he did everything wrong, at least up to the very end. And this morning, we're going to take a look at Samson and see if we can see a little bit of ourselves in Samson and a little bit of Samson in ourselves. After all, what is a hero, really? We call him a hero of the faith. What is a hero? Heroes put on their pants or they put on their pantyhose one leg at a time, just like we do. When it comes right down to it, we aren't much different from Samson. First of all, we're going to take a look at his birth. His birth was a miracle. And our birth is a miracle. If you've been born again, you have a miracle birth. Samson had a miracle birth. Samson took the Nazarite vow, which we're going to take a look at in a little bit. And the Nazarite vow that he took was a covenant between him and God. Don't we have a covenant between us and God? Yes, we do. What do you think baptism was? When you were baptized, that was a special covenant between you and God. Samson had godly parents. Now, maybe some of you had godly parents, maybe some of you don't or didn't. But he was a man who had godly parents. Samson was a man who had a special calling from God. Don't we have a special calling from God? Doesn't it say in the scriptures that we are ambassadors for Christ? That's a special calling from God. And then he had a spiritual anointing from the Holy Spirit. 
Don't we have a spiritual anointing from the Holy Spirit? Didn't the Holy Spirit indwell us at the time that we were saved? We're a lot like Samson. Let's take a look, first of all, at his birth and conception. Turn with me to Judges chapter 13. Judges chapter 13. I left my Bible down here. Judges chapter 13, verse 1. Judges chapter 13, verse 1. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Notice it says again, again. The Jews over and over and over again did this. They had a whole series of backsliding in their history. They were on a constant roller coaster. First they would sin, and then there was servitude, and then supplication, and then salvation, and then silence, and then they would sin again, and it went through the whole thing over and over again, just like we do. Israel and us, very much alike. But 1 John 1, 9 breaks the cycle. 1 John 1, 9, notice what that says. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That breaks the cycle. God wants us to break the cycle. Israel was in one of their backslidden times. And notice what it says here in verse 1. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines. Now, sometimes I say Philistines, and sometimes I say Philistines. So whatever, you know what I'm talking about. Here are the Philistines. And this is where we get our word Palestine, and this is where we get our word Palestinians from. Originally, they came from Greece. They came from Greece, and they went into Egypt, and they tried to fight their way. They attacked Egypt, and they weren't very good at that, and they lost. And so they went north into Israel, and they settled in there. Now, they were fierce fighters, but they had a better plan when they went into Israel. They thought to themselves, instead of fighting, what we're going to do is we're going to intermarry with the Jews. And we're going to make the Jews a part of our family. And therefore, they're not going to want to drive us out because they will be our brother-in-law and sister-in-law and nieces and nephews and cousins. And they're not going to want to drive us out because we'll be kin to all of them. And so they began to clash with the Jews and the clash has existed between the Palestinians and the Jews even up until this day. Look in verse 2, Judges chapter 13, verse 2. Now there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. Now she had no children, and to the Jews, it meant to the Jews that they had lost favor with God. It meant that God decided not to bless them for some reason because there was something wrong in their life. That's just the way they thought. Now, God has a lesson for Israel here. God is saying to Israel, out of barrenness shall come blessing if you will repent and turn to me. So here's a barren woman who's going to be blessed. If your Christian life today, this morning, seems barren, God wants to bring blessing into your life. Amen? God wants to bless you. He wants to. What we need to do is we need to repent and to turn to him. That's what God is telling Israel at this time. Look in verse 3 and 4. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, please be careful. Please be careful now not to drink wine or similar drink and not to eat anything unclean. God wanted a commitment from her before he would bless her. You see, that's how God works. God wants to have us be committed to him, and then he will bless us. Now, we get blessings all the time from God, whether we're committed to him or not. But God says, I will give you special blessings. I will give you the blessings I want to give you if you will, in turn, be committed to me. That's how it's going to work for this woman. That's how it's going to work for Israel. That's how it's going to work for us. So she committed herself to God, and God blessed her. Now look in verse 5. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall, 
shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Now God also wanted this man Samson to be committed unto him. So God could use him as a judge over Israel. The Nazarite vow that Samson took basically had four commitments to it. First of all, he was to abstain from all intoxicating drinks. As a matter of fact, the Bible says he wasn't even supposed to eat grapes. <laughs> no intoxicating drinks, no grapes. Secondly, he was not to cut his hair because his hair was a visible symbol of his commitment, just like our baptism is a visible symbol of our commitment to God. So he wasn't to cut his hair. Three, he was to avoid contact with the dead. And four, he was to refuse to eat any unclean food. Now, usually the Nazarite vow was just a temporary vow. It was uh, usually between 30 and 100 days. But in this case, and in several cases, it was a lifetime vow. And with Samson, it was a lifetime vow. We see that with John the Baptist, and we see that with Samuel. Samson now is going to commit himself to serve God for the rest of his life because God had a plan for him to free his people from Palestine, from the Philistines. All Samson had to do was to be faithful to God and follow God's plan. Now, isn't that simple? <laughs> All we have to do is be faithful to God and to follow his plan. It's the same plan that God has for our life. Be faithful to God and follow his plans. It says in Matthew 6, verse 33, Matthew 6, 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek God first, and he'll bless us. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Let's look at the second thing, Samson's corruption. Samson takes some detours along the way. His name Samson comes from the Hebrew word Shimshon, which means strong. And Samson was strong. He was the strongest man that ever lived. Look at chapter 13. Go over chapter 13, verse 24 and 25. So the woman bore a son and called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at Mahanay, Dan, between Zorah and Eshtael. Now, Samson started out pretty good, but then Samson weakened, not physically, but spiritually. He had several ruinings in his life. Ruin number one, he fraternized with the enemy. Samson took a bride of the Philistines, chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Now Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as a wife. Then his father and mother said to him, uh, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. Now Samson's acting like a spoiled brat, isn't he? I want that woman. You go get her for me. That's the way they did it back then. You go get her for me. Now, this was strictly forbidden by God in Deuteronomy 7, 3, and 4. It says that they aren't to do this. Why? Because God knew that this would only corrupt his people. God knew it. So there's a lesson here. Even though we're saved, we're still attracted to the things of the world. Samson was attracted to the things of the world, and so are we. The three thorns, remember the three thorns, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And Samson's going to fall for all three of those. But God has called us to a life of separation. We're in the world, but we're not to be of the world. There's an old saying that I like to give. It says, choose your friends wisely, you become what they are. 
Choose your friends wisely. You become what they are. God didn't want them fraternizing with the enemy. And the same with us. We can get too friendly with the enemy. We can get too friendly with the world. We can get too friendly with Satan. Now, we're not to isolate ourselves from the world. We're to insulate ourselves from the world, but we're not to isolate ourselves from the world. But we're also not to become like the world. How do you know when your life becomes worldly? You can think about yourself in these things. You can think about somebody else. How do you know when your life has become worldly? Well, it's when you get caught. It's when you get caught. Let me give you a story here. It says, a man was speeding down the highway, feeling secure in a gaggle of cars, all traveling at the same speed. However, as they passed the speed trap, he got nailed with an infrared speed detector and was pulled over. The officer handed him the citation, received his signature, and was about to walk away when the, uh, the man asked, Officer, I know I was speeding, but I don't think it's fair. There were plenty of other cars around me going just as fast, so why did I get the ticket? Ever go fishing? The policeman suddenly asked the man. Uh, yeah, so? The officer grinned and added, ever catch all the fish? <laughs> well, we get caught if we're living for the world. Now, here are some things that we can know how do we know when our life becomes too worldly? Number one, when, they, uh, when what they value, you begin to value. When what they value, you begin to value. Then you're getting too close to the world. Number two, when they have more influence over you than you have over them. Too worldly. Number three, when there becomes no difference between your behavior and their behavior. Too worldly. Then you've been caught. Then you've been corrupted by the world. So ruin number one, he fraternized with the enemy. Ruin number two, he wasted his strength. And when I think about that, I think about Solomon. Solomon didn't waste his strength. What did Solomon waste? He wasted his wisdom. God gave him wisdom above all other people. And he did some mighty unwise things. He wasted the wisdom that God gave him. Samson is wasting the strength that God gives him. We find that he killed a lion with his bare hands. Chapter 14, Judges 14, 5 and 6. So Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he tore the lion apart as one would have torn apart a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Now that's quite a feat of strength, isn't it? To take a lion and to rip it open. To kill a lion. The best I can do is kill time. <laughs> but he killed a lion with his bare hands. But look at verses 7 through 9. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased him well, Samson well. After some time, when he returned to get her, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the carcass of the lion. He took some of it in his hands and went along eating. When he came to his father and mother, he gave some to them, and they also ate. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. Why didn't he tell his parents that he'd taken the honey out of the carcass of a lion? Because he was not to touch a dead body. And he'd failed in the commitment that he had made to God. He was not supposed to come in contact with anything that was dead. And he's going to break his Nazarite vow. Then next he single-handedly killed 30 uh, Philistines in chapter 14, verse 19. Chapter 14, verse 19. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he went down to Ashkelon and killed 30 of their men. He killed 30 of them. Now it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon him in a mighty way, and he killed 30 people. Now, some people have asked, if he wasn't supposed to touch a dead body, why did the Spirit of the Lord come upon him 
and allow him to kill 30 of the enemy if he wasn't supposed to touch, to touch a dead body. And the answer to that is, when he touched those bodies, they weren't dead. <laughs> they were dead after he touched them. Hello, is anybody out there? <laughs> okay. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he did kill them, but he didn't touch any dead bodies because they were only dead after he touched them. Well, uh, he then killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. Look at chapter 15. Verses 14 and 15. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him. Then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him once again, so he had great strength. And the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that is burned with fire, and his bonds broke loose from his hands. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, reached out his hand and took it and killed a thousand men with it. What happened again? His hands never touched a dead body, but with that jawbone of an ass, he killed a thousand people. And there's one thing I can learn from this, and it gives me hope. If God can use the jawbone of an ass, God can use me. God can use even you. Three times it says here that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Now that's grace. We find grace all throughout the life of Samson. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. But this is the last time it is said of, of Samson. Samson had violated his oath to God, not only by his contact with the dead, but also his constant immorality with harlots. Aren't you glad that God is full of grace? God is full of mercy and God is full of love and God is full of mercy and forgiveness. Aren't you glad that God is so patient with us? He was with Samson. Samson had another problem beside his backsliding and his immorality with women. He also had a problem with pride. You see, Samson was a show-off. He liked to show his strength. He catches 500 foxes and he pairs them up. He ties their tails together, attaches a torch and burns the field of the Philistines. By the way, you can also do this with cats, but don't try this at home, okay? All it did was antagonize the Philistines. That's all it did. No good whatsoever. He had a weakness for harlots. One time he went to a harlot, and the Philistines plotted to kill him the first thing in the morning. And so at midnight, Samson gets up and he goes to the city gates of the city of Gaza. Now the city gates, they represented the strength of the city. If you have a fortified city, the city is only as strong as the strength of the gates. And at the city gates, this is where they would meet and this is where they'd have council together. This is where they'd socialize. And so the city gates were very important to a city. So what Samson does, he gets up at midnight, he goes to the city gates, he pulls up the city gates and the posts of the gates and then carries them 40 miles away to the top of a hill. This would be a great insult to the Philistines. Why did he do this? He only did this to antagonize them. He did this to show off. Then we see his conclusion. Well, you know the story. Samson takes up with a woman. Her name is Delilah, and she's a Philistine woman. And she was given the assignment of finding out the strength of Solomon, the secret of his strength. She was a CIA agent for the Philistines, and so her assignment was to find out his strengths. So they were tired. The enemy was tired of Samson's taunting them all the time, and they wanted to defeat him once and for all, put a stop to Samson. Look at chapter 16, verses 4 and 5. Afterward it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah, and the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him and find out where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him that we may bind him to afflict him, and every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Now what does this 
tell you and tell me. First of all, it tells me that Samson did not look like Hulk Hogan. Samson did not have muscles. If he did, they would have known the source of Samson's strength. They would have seen his big, hulky body, and they would have said, his strength is in his muscles. But no, they hired a woman to find out where his strength was. So Samson looked more like me than he did Hulk Hogan. Samson looked more like Pastor Jack than he did Hulk Hogan. Now you can go home and you can get on your telephone and you can call people and you can say, come next Sunday, our pastor's going to be here and he has a body like Samson. You got to come see him. He wasn't muscle bound because they didn't know where his strength was from. If you want to tell people, you know, that your pastor, I am built like Samson. If I were to make a movie of Samson, I would have in the starring role of Samson, I'd have Don Knotts <laughs> playing Samson because they couldn't figure out where his strength came from. His lifestyle didn't lead the Philistines to think that his strength came from God. There should have been some evidence that Samson was a man of God, but there wasn't. It never occurred to the Philistines that maybe Samson's strength came from God. They didn't know where his strength came from. Three times Delilah tries to get Samson to tell her where he got his strength. And three times Samson lies to her. Oh, what a wicked woman. I read this story. A man, got, a man goes to see his rabbi. He says, Rabbi, something terrible is happening, and I have to talk to you about it. The rabbi asks, what's wrong? The man replied, my wife is poisoning me. The rabbi, very surprised by this, asks, I'm sure you're wrong. The man pleads, I'm telling you, I'm certain she's poisoning me. What should I do? The rabbi then offers, I'll tell you what, let me talk to her. I'll see what I can find out, and I'll let you know. A week later, the rabbi calls the man and says, well, I spoke to your wife. I spoke to her on the phone for three hours. You want my advice? The man anxiously says, yes, please. Okay, take the poison, the rabbi says. Well, that's the way Delilah was. She was poisoned to this man. So the fourth time Delilah pulls out all the stops, Delilah really knows how to get to a man. Look at chapter 16, verses 15 through 17. Then she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? In other words, if you really love me, Samson, oh boy, you have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death that he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. She nagged him, and she nagged him, and she nagged him. Samson, if you really love me, ladies, don't try this at home. Did it work? Yes, it worked. <laughs> but don't try this at home, please. So she gets paid for revealing Samson's secret, and while Samson's asleep, she gets somebody to come and shave his head. And then Samson is as weak as a kitten. Now, was Samson's hair really the source of his strength? No. Did God really need for Samson to have a full head of hair to make him strong? No. Can God use a man who is bald? <laughs> yes. Or one who is, as they call me, follically challenged? Yes. You don't have to have a full head of hair for God to use you. Samson's hair was merely a visual reminder of the commitment that he had made to God. 
Samson didn't become weak because he lost his hair. Why was Samson weak? Look at chapter 16, verse 20. Chapter 16, verse 20. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Wow. This is one of the saddest verses in the Bible. He didn't know that the Spirit of the Lord had departed him. He didn't know. The Lord God had departed from him, and he didn't even know it. Sad. When Samson's hair was cut, he also cut his ties with God and God's power. It wasn't that he didn't have any hair. It's that his ties were cut with God's power. It's the last visible sign of his commitment to God, and it was gone. The power was in God. The power wasn't in Samson. It wasn't in his hair. So now Samson is captured by the Philistines. His eyes are gouged out, and he becomes a laughingstock to the enemy. Chapter 16, verse 21. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in the prison. There's a lesson here. Satan can remove our hair. That is, Satan can tempt us to turn from our commitment to God. Satan can ruin our testimony. Satan can cut our hair, but he can't remove the roots. In other words, he can't remove the fact that we're saved. Amen? He can remove the hair, but he can't remove the roots. God is a God of a second chance, and now God is going to give Samson a second chance. So the Philistines have a big party, and they bring in Samson. They want to ridicule him. So they put Samson between two huge pillars, and these pillars support their temple. And there's Samson. Verse 28. Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me. I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God, that I may be, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. Samson prays to God. And this is the only time in the Bible that we read about Samson praying. Oh, he showed off a lot, and he did a lot of bad things, but we never heard of Samson praying before now. But Samson gets right with God. Samson has been humbled. Samson repents, and Samson cries out to God, and now God can use him, hair or not. God can use him. God gives Samson back his strength, and Samson brings the house down, literally. Look in verses 29 and 30. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the lords and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. Hmm. What lessons can we learn from Samson this morning? First of all, don't let the world corrupt you. Samson loved the world. He loved the world too much. And the world overcame him. It took away his relationship with the Lord God. Don't let sin rule and ruin your life. Secondly, don't waste your strength. Solomon wasted his wisdom. Samson wasted his strength. Samson wasted his strength by playing silly, taunting games with the enemy. If you're a Christian, God has given us strength. Strength to have victory over the flesh and victory over temptation and victory over sin. God has given us strength. Don't waste your strength. Don't waste the strength that God has made available to us. Use the power that the Holy Spirit has given to you at the time you were saved. Like Samson, we have unlimited potential, unlimited power, and unlimited resources. Why? Because God has unlimited power and unlimited strength and unlimited resources. Don't look to your own strength to try to live your Christian life. Look to God's strength and God's power and God's resources. 
Another lesson I see here is that God is the God of the second chance. God is the God of the third chance and the fourth chance and the fifth chance. How many chances has God given you? He's given me a lot of chances. God is the God of the second chance. When Samson renewed his commitment to God, he was able to do great things for God. And that's why Samson is in the hall of fame and not in the hall of shame. Samson came back to God. doesn't matter how far you've strayed from God. It only matters that you're willing to come back to God. Have you gotten involved in the world that you've lost your strength to live for Christ? Then come back to him. How do we come back to him? We repent of our sins and we put our trust in God. You see, it wasn't Samson's great strength that put him in the hall of faith. It wasn't Samson's great faith that put him in the hall of faith. What was it? It was the fact that Samson put his little faith into a big God. And we may have little faith. I have little faith. But if we'll put our little faith in a big God, we can do great things for God. It was the object of his faith that made Samson so great in the end. In spite of all his failures and sin and straying from his faith, Samson came back to God. Physically, he started off strong, but he became weak. Spiritually, he started off weak, but he finished strong. And throughout his life, Samson wasn't faithful to God many times. But throughout his life, God was faithful to Samson. Amen? God is faithful. God never gave up on him. And God will never give up on you. And God will never give up on me. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your faithfulness to us. Our faithfulness to you is not what it ought to be. And Father, sometimes we fail you, and sometimes we just we let our flesh and our pride have control over us. But Father, you give us a second chance to come back to you. And if there's any here this morning who's fallen away from you, who's strayed, if their life is barren this morning, I pray that they might come to you because you're always willing to receive those who come to you. We ask this now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together as we sing our invitation.